the sermon that I had prepared today. Um, Holy Spirit kindly does that every once in a while and yanks your chain a little bit and changes your direction, so therefore you've got to rely directly on that, but that's okay. Um, because of we are to having this wedding today, um, I did a retreat. We did a retreat uh, for married couples here. Time flies a year. Okay, that's two years ago. Two years ago. And so I'm going to do a little bit of something on that. But you know, there's so much to marriage today and the sanctity of marriage. Well, I think it took us four. I did four studies on that trip when we did it, and I probably could have done more than that. Um, but uh, it's something that's so important. But just like everything else in the world today, if they're falling away from God, you know, they're falling away from His laws, they're falling away from His commandments and passing laws that are against the laws and the commandments of God. And people don't understand and realize just how important the sanctity of marriage is Amen. with God. And it's, it's taken very lightly today. Um, people get married and, you know, they have some little problem here and there. And I'm not talking about anything major, you know, and that's the answer. Let's get a divorce. You know, well, one of the reasons it's so important, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you go ahead and start turning in your Bibles here. And I'll probably use some of this uh, when, I'm, when I'm marrying the couple today, but that's okay. Um, going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. I'm going to sit down today. I didn't do that very often. Now I could list a whole a whole list of reasons why that is so important to God. Um, but you know, one of the things is, you know, we are supposed to be in in a spiritual sense, we are supposed to be the bride of Christ. And he is the husband. And we are waiting for his return today so that we can be joined back together with Him. Um, so that's just one of many, many uh, reasons that, that the sanctity of marriage is important. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out a couple other things, even though we are talking about um, the sanctity of marriage. I know that there are a lot of folks in this church, and some I don't know, but most of, a lot of them that I do know, that have been divorced. I mean, can I get a hand raised? Who's, who's, I'm not trying to point you out or nothing or shame you. Just, you know, I raised my hand. I ain't been divorced, but anyway. <laughs> I, I, huh? What's the question? Well, no, there was no question. I was just pointing out the reason I'm saying that is not to, to shame you, but, you know, there's a lot of churches I've been to in my life, even with my mother, which this is the thing that I remember the most because it really hurt me for her is she was made to feel like a second-class citizen in the church because she was divorced. And, you know, and I've seen ministers literally call people out in the congregation, and that's not right. And I wasn't calling you out, by the way. I was just making a point. But would literally point them out and treat them differently because they are divorced. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Is divorce an unforgivable sin? No. no. No, there's only one unforgivable sin in the Bible. Now, is it a sin to be divorced? Well, that depends on what the circumstances are. Um, you know, there's actually written scripture in the Bible, in the laws of the Old Testament, as well as even in with Jesus Christ, that there are cases and reasons for a divorce. Um, that you, you can do that and move on with your life um, you can move on with your life without being shamed or, or to be made feel guilty. I tell you what, it makes me mad. It really does when people are treated badly because of that, because of their ignorance. And they don't know the Word of God like they should. Amen. We are all the children of God. We all make mistakes. We all fall short and we all sin. Amen. And to treat somebody less than just because they, they had a divorce is just no reason for it. Um, there are circumstances, and I tell you, one of the ones that, that really brings me to mind is I had a woman come to me for counsel, and uh, I'll never forget this. She said that uh, her husband used to beat her unmercifully. I mean, to the point of putting her into the hospital and such. So she reached out to her minister 
at that time and he told her that it was her job, her obligation to God to stay in that situation. Now people get upset about when I say this, I'd like to take them behind the woodshed. Amen. That's right. God does not expect anybody to be subjected to abuse. Nobody. I mean, does He want you to try to work your marriage out if there's any way possible for you to salvage it? Absolutely. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, and I can't think of where the Scripture is, you just have to forgive me for that today, but Deuteronomy or the book of Numbers or whatever, and it says something about a man when he finds un an uncleanliness in the woman. Well, of course, everybody's first thought is adultery. That's not what it's talking about. It, it's actually compatibility. Sometimes you make a mistake and you get married to somebody you thought you fell in love with. You was crazy, you know, that one you just had to have. That happens to people a lot. You know, they fall in love and stuff, and then when they get together, they find out they're not compatible. It's life. It, you know, if you if you would have a... I'm fixing to have to get up out of chair now. I'm a... Yeah, don't worry. I know, but she's got this camera right here, so... Um, Sometimes we're just not compatible. And, uh, and sometimes we just make a mistake. Is it a sin to get a divorce? Yes, it is, but not in all circumstances. But once you ask for forgiveness of it, you've got a clean slate. Amen. Amen. Did Jesus Christ not die on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sin? Amen. So why does some minister think he's got the right to stand before a congregation and shame them for being divorced? Now, I didn't come here today to talk about divorce, but I just felt led to do that. I mean, I, I come here to talk about the sanctity of marriage um, and, and how important that it, that it really is. And like I said, I, there's no way I could go over everything that you need to know, but I will tell you this. If you're married or thinking about getting married, you may be young, thinking about getting married, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good information in this Bible Amen. that will tell you how to have a successful marriage. Now I'm going to say something that's going to be unpopular, but you know how shy I am about stuff. Um, you know, there's, we've got a lot of couples in here that are not married that are, that are having premarital sex. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, is that a sin? Yes, it is a sin. Is it unforgivable? No, it's not unforgivable. So why is Pastor Jimmy telling you about that? See, because there's so many things in this journey with God that we can do that hinders our prayers and hinders our blessings. So I'm telling the young people and even some adults in here that are not married that are living their life that way, it could be hurting your walk with God and it could be hindering your blessings with God and, and Him answering your prayers. So I always encourage, hey, if you're with the person you think you're supposed to be with, you're all in, then make it legal. Hey, we're doing a wedding today. <laughs> Anybody else want to get married? <laughs> I thought Maverick was going to throw something at me there. You having a two for one sale? Yeah, hey, a three for one sale. Um, but seriously, I, I, I'm telling you that because, and if it makes you feel better, did I have sex before I got married? Yes, I did. Was it a sin? Yes, it was. Did I ask forgiveness of it? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay, I'm not up here standing up here thinking I'm better than anybody. I'm just saying, I'm trying to help you in your walk with God today. That you need to, if you want it, if you're going to do it, let's do it. Let's do it right. right. And you know, if if you if you think you're there and that's the one, then then it's time. Then get married to that person, um, and that will help you with your walk with God and, and your prayer time and everything else. Whew, man, the Holy Spirit played up. Trick on me today having me up here standing up here doing this today. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's so much more to it. And also, you know, mine and Jerry's door is, is always open, you know, for anybody that's having marital problems that needs to talk. And the thing about it is, you know, I, I remember when we were having problems, we lived in Memphis. I, I didn't want to go to no marriage counselor. I didn't want to go. I mean, she had to pull me there kicking and dragging and kicking. You know why? Because I thought, well, the real reason is why is because I was in the wrong. You know what I'm saying? But at the time, you know, I thought, no, they're going to pick on me. You know, they're going to, it's all my fault. I know I didn't want to go. But now, let me tell you the difference between that and, and that is that if you do marriage counseling with us, it's strictly from the Bible. Not to mention we've been married 37 years. 
And I mean, it's, it's you know, it's not always. We've had our ups and downs, just like anybody. Amen. You're gonna go through things, and it just is. But at least you're prepared if you're doing it God's way. Amen. And of course, the first thing I'm gonna recommend to them is put God first in your life. Amen. Put God first in your marriage. <laughs> I guarantee you, we'd have a lot less divorces and a lot more happy people in the world if they if they did it if they did it God's way. So, in chapter five, um, trying to decide where I really wanted to start on this, but uh, I tell you what, let's let's just start with verse seventeen, and this is also directed just as followers of God in, in general, but we can also apply it to our relationships and our marriage. And what God expects. So verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I don't know about you now, but when I pray to God about anything, I pray for His will Amen. to be done in my life. Because if it's not God's will, you don't want it. Amen. Well, you can take a look at that in your relationships, in your marriage, or maybe you're thinking of getting back married. You want to do God's will. Right. So you need to be praying to God about it. You pray to God about it. He'll give you the answer whether you're supposed to be where you're at and whether you're supposed to be who you're with. But anyway, we can use that scripture, like I said, pray for God's will in your life. Every day, every decision that you make, and I ain't talking about praying to God to park your car. If you ain't got enough sense to know where to park your car, you're in trouble. Amen. But when you are making decisions concerning your relationship and your marriages and a job change or whatever, how to raise your kids or how to discipline them for something in particular, you always pray to God for everything. Amen. I mean, when it says uh, pray without ceasing, it doesn't mean to sit on the floor and pray until you die of starvation. Oh. It, it, that means you continue to pray for it. Each and every day you pray for it. Pray for God's will to be done in your life. You might get it right the first time with the right with the right person that you marry when you do that. And uh, I'm, I mean, I thank God that I've never been divorced, um, only because I see you know how hard it is on people when they go through it. And, and anyway, kids are involved in, in mixed families and the whole nine yards. There's a whole gamut of things, you know, to be considered in that. Um, I tried my best, did everything wrong that I possibly could, but she had every right to divorce me. But, <laughs> but uh, I guess God had better plans. All I can say, she's, a lot of people think she's weak. She's probably one of the strongest women I've ever met in my life. Amen. Uh, and that's true. That's absolutely true. All right, verse 18. And be not drunk uh, with wine wherein in excess. Aren't we supposed to do everything with moderation? Yes. But be filled with the Spirit. And I don't mean the spirits of Jack Daniel. Okay? <laughs> filled with the Spirit. Um, it says, "Be not drunk with wine, wear it excess." Now, this is kind of off subject, but that's with everything. It, it's not a sin to drink. And boy, I tell you what, ministers hear me say that, and they get all puckered up. What was the? What was this? Is off subject. What was the first miracle of Jesus Christ? Now, if the brother didn't, if if the brother didn't want them to drink, then why would he change the water to wine and just make them drink water? <clears throat> But it's not in excess. I mean, I don't care to tell you, I had to put it down because I liked it too much. I had to put it away, plus I'm a minister, and I'm supposed to set an example for those who struggle with that addiction. Um, but I loved it. I loved it. I liked it too much. So therefore, I had to put it down. If you can't do it in moderation, then stay away from it. That's right. All right, verse 19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the Gospel. Verse 20. For, oh, did I get off track? Man, I still say it don't make sense. Alright, here we go again. Alright, verse 19. I'm just saying if y'all are paying attention, God bless you. Uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. Man, God is good. Giving thanks always. Do you thank God every day? Do you tell Him that you love Him every day? Amen. I give God thanks when I pray each and every morning for everything that is good in my life. 
But I also thank God for getting me out of some of the messes I got myself into. Giving thanks always for things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there you have the, the, the Godhead, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and God and Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in fear of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you in fear of God today? No. Fear translated back to the Greek the majority of the time in this Bible means revere, to love God. All right, so submitting yourselves one to another in love of God. Amen. I got news for you. If you put God first in your life, that's not to say you're not going to have trials and tribulations because you are. Jesus Christ did, and He said that we would. But if you put Him in the forefront of your life, it makes you strong enough to get through Amen. those trials and tribulations. It makes you strong enough to work out your problems with your mate or with your spouse. I mean, it gives you... I mean, this is a road map. I call it an atlas. Get your dead gum atlas out, blow the dust off of it, and learn the ways of the Lord so that He can direct your footsteps. You put God in the forefront of everything that you do and He will guide your steps. He will, make, he will help you to avoid the potholes in this life. And, and so much less. Man, I tell you what, if I had this relationship that I have today with God, I would have saved myself so much pain, Amen. so much trouble, so much regret. I really would. If you put Him in the forefront of your life, it's going to spare you, especially you young people. You know, put God in the forefront of your life. And I tell you what, it'll make your life a lot easier. It really will. Now, you can try to do it on your own because I've tried that. I've tried that before. It didn't work too good. And old devil will be kicking your tail up and down the road. You don't even know it. Alright, so, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's a big statement right there. Submit yourselves unto your own husband as to the Lord. Now, we had Adam and Eve. We had the transgression in, in, in the garden. And because of the transgression that happened in the garden, did God make the man the head over the woman? Alright? And that's the way it is. Whether you like it or you don't like it. But now, He didn't say be subject unto a fool. That's right. Okay? Yeah. So a lot of ministers like to stand up here and keep the little women in line, you know, and say, well, you're supposed to be submitted unto me. You sit in church and you be quiet, keep your mouth shut, and you do what I say. The problem is, the stipulation in that, without going somewhere else in the Bible right now, is the fact that if the man's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, right. you don't listen to a fool. Come on. Boy, that makes me mad when I say that too. <laughs> but it's true. No, true. It's true. They have to do their part. They have to be feeling their obligation in this Word in order for that woman to be subject under Him. Alright? They love using that Scripture for that though. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. So the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. I don't see too much of that going on today. What is Christ to the church? He died for it. He died for it. He gave His life for it. He shed His blood for it. And that is the same love that a man is supposed to have for his wife. You don't see a lot of that today. Men are not... And we had also did another retreat here about a year ago, men's retreat, and that's what, isn't that what it was about? The role of a husband. The role of a man in general. Men aren't stepping up to the plate like they should. I'm going to tell you something. I love seeing men in church. You couldn't drag me to church when I was younger, though. I was kicking and screaming. I didn't want a part of it. But I'm going to tell you something. When I see men in church and we've got as many men in here as we do the women, that, that, that man it just tickles me to death. Amen. Because you don't see men standing up and being 
a good man, a good husband, or a good father to their children today. And that's why, again, there you go. Look at one intricate part in God's Word, and then the, fa- and then the family's falling apart. So these men that won't take rule over the wife and then go out in the world and act like idiots, I'm sorry, but it just don't work that way. That's a big statement right there. <clears throat> For your husband is the head of the wife, and even Christ is the head of the church. Alright, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives to their own husbands and everything. If you're truly doing it right according to God's Word, there's absolutely no reason why you cannot come together and work something out that works for both of you come to some kind of an agreement. See, because that's what God... Yes, the man is the head. Okay? So at the end of it all, he gets the last say in it. But I say this to the men. There ain't no reason why you can't find common ground and come together in agreement. And that is what you're supposed to do when you are married. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and give Himself to it. That's the way it's supposed to be. That He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. Who is the living water? It is Jesus Christ. Who is the living Word? Jesus Christ. If you're doing it according to the Bible, it's going to work. That He might present to Himself His glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be only without blemish. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For yet, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, and even as the Lord of the church. Now, if, the, if a man is supposed to treat his wife as if it was himself, would he sit there and cuss himself out? Would he sit there and jump up and down? Would he be slopping or drunk, falling in the floor, abusing his kids, slapping his wife? Is that what a man would do to himself? No, he wouldn't do that to himself. But yet there are men out in the world doing that today. And that is not pleasing to God. Amen. Man, if you wonder why I'm so hard on men, and because I've, I've been there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking when I never slap my wife now or, or anything like that, but... I'm just saying, I mean, I've always not, not always been the husband that I should have been to her. So I'm, I'm passing on the Word of God to you to help you cut to where you're not going to have those problems. Verse 30, For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Amen. That's the way we're supposed to operate is one flesh. So how are you going to make a decision without your partner? You're one flesh. God comes first. And I had to learn this lesson the hard way. The, kid, the, the God comes first and then your wife after that as far as the man and the woman are concerned, vice versa. And then the kids. Amen. Now, me and her could have got a divorce if we had listened to our kids. They had it set in their minds that we didn't need to be together no more. But see, the problem was we weren't putting each other first and putting the kids first. Come on. Starts with God, then it starts with the, the couple, the married couple, and then the children. Because if the parents are not reunited in that, it's not going to work, folks. Amen. It's not... And then it, let's just take the wedding we're doing today. I almost stepped all the way back to the curtain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I guess the door's open, so we'll go there. All right, so, you know, there's a lot of blended families. There's a lot of blended families sitting in here today. It's going to be another blended family when Mike and, and Brenda get married. The same principle applies here. So what I might say right now, some people might disagree with it. But, you know, when, when it, it, you got blended families, but it's still you two. Y'all are supposed to be united as one and making decisions together. God, then the couple, then the kids. 
Uh, so I've heard I've heard this so many different times in a lot of different situations. And I don't even have to do anything with this church. The people I've done counsel with in here. I mean, I see it all the time and have seen it all the time where a blended family comes together, and then the husband might want to correct the children of the woman's children from another marriage, or vice versa, and they won't let them do that. That's not right. That's not right. Amen. One, you're supposed to be one flesh. Somebody's living under your house, you're the head of the household, then they have to abide by those rules of the mother and the father. It doesn't matter whether it be the woman or the man. It's never going to work if you don't. You've got to come together in agreement on everything that you do in order to have a successful marriage. But God first. I can't say that enough. God first in that. <clears throat> This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Can I get an amen? amen.